The 1960s saw drag racing emerge from risky rides on the streets to an organized super sport thundering through the souls of thousands across the nation. The southern United States took it even further, introducing 3,000-pound heads-up drag racing. These two-car match races attended by thousands of adrenaline-filled young men with a passion for cars and a creative streak a mile wide. Herb McCandless was one of those young men. Earning the nickname Mr. Four Speed, Herb hit the drags with a never-say-die attitude that put him in the driver's seat when it came to shaping his future. In just four years of driving, he goes from a teenager racing on the streets to a respected professional level racer, catching the eye of some of the most influential people in the sport, including track owners, management at Chrysler, and a whole host of drivers like the owners of the venerable Sox and Martin team. Stepping into what is being hailed as the super season of 1970 in drag racing, Herb has positioned himself on the precipice of greatness, and he's not the only one looking for something special. In 1969, we were doing a tremendous amount of match racing, and just two-car match races were drawing a large crowd. And so toward the latter part of 69, I was able to get Jenkins and Wally Booth and uh, two or three others in a room and worked on putting some rules together that we thought would make a great show, you know, heads up racing. And we uh, sat down and we, you know, had a Ford person, a Chevrolet person, a, a Dodge and a Plymouth and came up with uh, rules that we thought would be fairly equal and uh, would make a good program. And so we put down on paper 27 things that we thought should be allowed to be done to the cars. Manufacturer reps and racers getting together to outline a new category designed to pack the fans in is a unique moment in history. And I was nominated to go to present it to NHRA. And of the 27 items that we presented, NHRA accepted 26 of them. So that's when Pro Stock began was, you know, 1970. So now it's official. There's a brand new class of racing coming and the stage is set for the ultimate manufacturer versus manufacturer battleground. It's the universal agreement between Detroit and the race teams that plays a big role in the NHRA's acceptance of the proposed program. In 1970, the NHRA rolls out drag racing as the sport of the 70s. They add three major events to the big four and set up their first ever super season. Rumors of the new class of racing are swirling all over the racetrack. Drivers from coast to coast and every state in between are looking for a chance to get in on it. I went to Phoenix in early 1970 and got in some sand or something on the track and wrecked my 68 dart. And so Maxwell came up to me and he said, hey Herb, Step has blown a motor up in their 68 car. He said, why don't you put your motor in Step's car and they'll let you drive it. Here's yet another great opportunity for Herb to showcase his engineering and driving skills to the team at Chrysler. This time for racer Billy Stepp in his 1968 Cuda known as Billy the Kid. So we took the motor out of my car, put it in Stepp's car, we went to Mona and tried to run a modified production. Well, the car was about 200 pounds too heavy and we weren't competitive. So I taught Bill and let me bring the car back to Memphis. And I said, let's put this car in B modified production and go to Gainesville. I said, we'll be fast. B Modified Production is filled with racing's top innovators and that makes it the perfect place for Herb. And here's what makes it really interesting. The Cuda was originally built by none other than Sox and Martin. So I brought the car back to Memphis, changed it over and, and made it right for B Modified Production. We went to Gainesville and I carried my 68 Dart there also. So I was driving two cars 
We made one qualifying run in the 68 car. I was the quickest car there in B-Mod Fire Production by about three or four tenths. Wasn't nobody even close. I set the record in the car and ran my 68 car and qualified it. So Sunday morning, we unloaded the cars. I'm running the modified car out of one set of staging lanes and the pro car out of the other set. I think Ronnie beat me about the third round of pro stock and I'm in the 68 Cuda running B-Modified Production. Well, I won Modified Eliminator in the 68 Cuda in Steps Car. So that was a pretty good weekend for me. The Sportsman Eliminator win in Steps Car at the first ever Gator Nationals is a huge milestone for Herb. And unlike the experience he had with Landy in Gainesville, Herb finished what he started. But Herb's got some fits and starts coming as he enters the new decade of racing. Still running his 68 car and coming off a big win in someone else's drag car, by April he's testing the waters, this time with Bill Tanner at Rockingham. Well, Bill was a great guy, built really good engines, but he just wasn't comfortable in a four-speed car. So they were at Rockingham with the car and they weren't even qualified. So I walked over there and walked up to Warren Tehart, who was the head of the thing, and I was always kind of a smart aleck, so I walked up and I said, why don't you let me make a run in that car? I said, y'all look like Ned and the first reader out here. So they finally agreed to let me make a run in it, and I qualified the car. So I was driving my car and their car on Sunday. So they talked to me after the race about driving that car. They got me to come to York, and they were supposed to have put a deal together where I was gonna drive the car for the rest of the year. So I get to York, and I made some runs in the car, qualified good, the car was fast. And so I cornered them about this contract they were supposed to have for me at York. Well, they said they just decided they weren't gonna do that. And so I just got out of the car. I said, you better find somebody to drive this thing the rest of the day, I'm done. And so I might've finished the race in the car. I don't remember, I was so mad. I was standing over the staging lanes talking to John Livingston. And this is when Pro Stock was starting up. And I didn't have the money to run Pro Stock and didn't have the equipment and whatever, but I really wanted to run it. And I told John, I said, I'm gonna find me a ride in a Pro Stock car. I said, it doesn't have to be a Dodge, I'm, I'm mad. I'm gonna find me a ride in a Pro Stock car. I said, cause I can drive the things. Well, I didn't know it, but Buddy Martin was standing right behind me. And Buddy tapped me on the shoulder and he said, you need to be driving a Plymouth. And I said, well, I can be talked to. May the 13th, about 10.30 in the morning, my phone rang at home in Memphis, and he was Buddy Martin. And he said, Herb, would you like to move to Burlington, North Carolina, and drive our second car? And Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, May the 15th, I lived in Burlington, North Carolina. You know, I packed up and moved 700 miles from Monday to Wednesday. My whole life changed in 1970. Herb's years of clean living, hard work, and brilliant automotive skill are all paying off. To me, the real important thing was is the person, the personality, they, their character, how they operated. And that was the one thing that always came forward in my mind when Herb's name came up was because what I saw him doing. I didn't see any cigarettes, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, and uh, those were important things. And I could tell that he was willing to work whatever amount of hours it took, whatever time it took, whatever he needed to do to be able to, to go racing. He wanted to race. I walked in the shop, and there sat the duster, my name on the door there. Everything Herb's dreamed of of having in life is finally right here for the taking. A steady racer's salary, a car of his own, all parts and expenses. Herb just has to maintain the car, shift fast, and win. With Marie supporting the move, Herb is in heaven and Buddy doesn't waste any time getting him behind the wheel of the duster and pitting up against some familiar faces. I went and ran Bill Jenkins in a match race that weekend and did real good. We beat him. Everything was great. And over the next two or three weeks in that car, I had trouble with the transmission in the car. Realizing something is wrong, Herb goes full on diagnostics mode, like he's done with every car he's ever driven. Just weeks into his professional contract, he's feeling a bit insecure about performance, but he's certain it's the car, not him. Well, I knew there wasn't nothing wrong with the transmission, and I had a week off that I didn't have a race. I told Buddy, I said, Buddy, something's wrong with this car. I said, I I'm not sure what it is exactly, but I'm gonna figure it out. With little mechanical difference between his winning 68 Dart and the 1970 Duster, Herb believes the answer might just be back in Memphis with the Dart. The first time I saw him, 
and he jumped out of that car before it even stopped. Yeah, I thought he was crazy. But after working with him for a, a while, I trusted him with anything that I had, and I knew that Herb knew what he was talking about, and uh, yeah, I had no problem with that. So I went to Memphis and took my 68 Dart to a bracket race over in Arkansas and won with absolutely no problem. So I came back and got the duster, took it to Memphis and parked it side by side with my 68 Dart, and we started measuring pieces. Herb discovers that Chrysler has shortened the clutch linkage on the 1970 models, making it easier to depress. For a family car, this is a significant improvement, but for the precision and timing that racing demands, it's a big problem. To solve the problem, Herb extends the linkage by adding a short strip of metal. So I fixed the clutch pedal in the car, and I never had another transmission problem with the car the rest of the year. Never had the transmission apart in the car the rest of the year. Now that Herb has the car where he wants it, he wastes no time making his mark. Back in Gainesville at the end of May, he wins big time at a points meet, this time as a pro. When I came with Buddy and Ronnie, I became the first person to ever win a sportsman eliminator and a professional eliminator in the same year, and I don't think but one other person's done it since then. And it took 20 years for that driver to do it. Herb's now frequently racing the big guys, and the pressure is on. Sunday! 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 At Smokin' U.S. 30 Drag Strip with a great ball. There's only about five major events back then. And we went to York, Pennsylvania, and I made it to the final against Landy, and there was so much difference between one lane of the track and the other. And back then, it didn't, they didn't take the fastest car and give them lane choice. You had to flip for lanes. Well, I lost the flip, and Landy had won five flips that day, been in a good lane all day long and I pushed the tree too hard and it was really stupid because I had him covered anyway and, and I wound up red lighting against him. This loss is especially bitter. But he never said a word. He, we just went on home and started all over again to go get ready to go to Andy, you know, three or four weeks later. Yep, Landy tossing Herb out of the driver's seat in 1969 at Pomona still smarts. Every Labor Day weekend since 1961, Indy is the host to NHRA's most important race of the year, the U.S. Nationals. And for the first time ever in 1970, pro stocks being contested there. Like NASCAR, if you're in racing, you want to win Daytona. If you're in racing and drag racing, you want to win the U.S. Nationals. Of course, we've been fortunate enough to do that with the uh, 68 car, but in pro stock, we had a 70 pro stock duster that Herb was driving. Along with Ronnie and Herb, there were over 90 top pro stockers in the pits. Against a field like this, you best be prepared. With just 32 qualifying spots, most of the drivers won't make it to Monday eliminations. We went up there as prepared as best as we possibly could with the best of everything we had. When we got there, the track was slicker than we thought it should have been. And I actually borrowed an aluminum flywheel from Bill Bagshaw and took the 20 pound wheel out of the car and put the aluminum wheel in the car on Saturday. And it was probably a very good decision because it did pick the car up a couple of hundreds. And Sunday, I couldn't tell you who I ran to be honest with you, you know, round per round, but uh, I was running the same numbers almost to the hundredth, you know, every run. And it came down to me and Vanky in the final. But this pro stock category is a little hotter. Red, white, and blue is McCandless. Mikey's on the far side. Postdoc title on the line right now. They're shifting all the way through, and it is close. And it's McCandless, the winner. Herb moved on him and held to the wind and uh, that was that was exciting. Herb's like the rookie that just clinched his first ever Super Bowl. The man just won the biggest pro stock race of the year. Uh, Dave, Christie, and Buddy were coming down the return road beside the track when we came by and I was in front. And Dave said he'd never seen Buddy that excited in his whole life. And I hadn't either. <laughs> when he got out of the car, he was tickled to death.
After all the work on the cars, all the miles, all the racing, all the lessons learned by the whole team, this is an emotional win for everyone. Uh, Ronnie got a little bit ill at me at the time because, you know, he knew that I was excited about Herb and about Herb winning and so forth. And of course, after I explained to Ronnie that it was good for Sox and Martin because it showed that we could do something besides just he driving the car, that we could build cars for other people that would be competitive, that Herb could go out there and represent us and, and win. And so he, you know, he was okay with it after that. Well, Ronnie is a diehard competitor to his very core. As a team owner, he understands how important this moment is for Sox and Martin, for Herb, for the sport, and for the fans. Well, you know, I just won the biggest thing of my life. And they had the Wide World of Sports would do about a 15, 20 minute show on the finals and stuff at the major events back then. So Chris Economaki of Vinnie, he stopped me as I was coming off the track, coming back around to the return road. The winner. That's the first big one for you, huh? Yes, sir, in the pro stock, I'm really happy. I just don't know what to say. And Ronnie Sox would be sitting down under that tree kind of green. Yeah. <laughs> Ronnie's, he has some transmission trouble. It's just one of those things. It's, I'd really be lucky and fast a lot of times. Really had to put the pressure on equipment this year, though, didn't you? Yes, we really did. We really pushed the cars hard. This was the toughest field of cars I've ever seen. Herb, you did a great job. Congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. Well, the young man from Burlington, North Carolina, Herb McCandless, wins his first major title at 27 years of age in the Sox and Martin Duster. Of course, I called my mom and told her I won. And it's a hard and fast rule in this era that women aren't allowed on the road. Racing is serious business at Sox and Martin, but sometimes rules just don't work out the way they're designed, and sometimes that's okay too. Marie actually drove from Burlington to uh, Andy herself. She had her own motel room. Uh, Ronnie went and picked her up uh, over in the pits, and she, she was about halfway down, sitting with, standing with Reed Wisnett and his group watching the final run. And, Ronnie went and got her and brought her down to the uh, winter circle for me. And it was, it was just great. I had a smile on my face, the undertaker couldn't have got off. I was tickled to death. As at that time, that was the closest NHRA final run that there'd ever been. There was only, I think, two thousandths of a second difference between us at the finish line. But I had left on him just a little bit, so I was about a fender in front. I knew when I put it in high gear, it was mine. And. Uh, that was a great day. Despite his win, after what happened with Landy and Pomona and Tanner and York, Herb's not about to sit back and rest on his laurels. Well, I left there and went to a NHRA points event at Amarillo the next weekend, where I won the division title there in pro stock. And as far as I was concerned, that was job security. I'd run it up at York, won Indy, and won Amarillo the week after. I knew I had a ride for the next year for sure. And Buddy told me that. He said, you know, you're here, no problem. Not only does Herb cinch his job security, he goes from regional hero to a member of an elite group of the best pro stock racers in the nation. One of the magazines put a deal together, the top 10 pro stock drivers, and I was one of the 10, and I was very proud of that. And, uh, Ronnie was still the, you know, the big favorite then. The Sox and Martin team loves racing so much that it's not unusual for Ronnie and Herb to enter a couple cars in different classes at the same race. This is the case with a 1970 Plymouth GT1 car they're running in AHRA's new class. GT car was a, a class that AHRA had put together. It was for big block cars like Camaros and Barracudas and Challengers and Mustangs and stuff like that, where you had to run a single four barrel. Well, the GT car was a, originally a Street Hemi car, Street Hemi Cuda, and we put a single four-barrel, uh, I think we put a NASCAR intake on or something, because nobody actually made a single four-barrel manifold for that car back then. And we put that on there and ran the car. It, I ran it three or four times that year, and, and uh, every time I ran it, I won with it. So I wound up winning the points thing in the, the GT class for AHRA for that year. Herb Shore has a lot to be proud of by the end of 1970. In addition to winning Indy, he's added a long line of notches to his shifter. Not bad for a rookie pro. Rolling into 1971, one of the most interesting stock cars on the track is a Plymouth Superbird. This is a highly modified, short-lived version of the Roadrunner. Buddy puts Herb in the front seat of a rare four-speed race model to run C-modified production. 
we took the Superbird to Pomona, and the car was fast. It was, you know, it was more of a toy than anything. It wasn't a real race car. Well, come Sunday, I went up first round, then I beat this black Chevy 2 out of Texas first round. When I got back to the timing booth, I knew the guy in the timing booth there, and he said, Herb, I didn't get a printout of a ticket for you for some reason. I said, well, okay, no big deal. So I go on back to the truck. I didn't think anything about it. And go up to run second round, and I go up in stage lanes, and the guy with the clipboard there said, Herb, what are you doing up here? I said, well, I won first round. They called us up for second round. He said, I don't have you on here. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, it says here the Chevy 2 won. I said, no, he didn't win. And he said, well, you're going to have to go find him in the pits and get him to come up here and tell us that you beat him. Well, that guy long gone headed home. He was from Texas. And Buddy went to the tower, and we tried talking to him, and they just flat wouldn't listen. And we didn't get to run for the eliminator with the Superbird out there. I was ill. A clerical error costs the team money and robs Herb of the spot that he has earned fair and square. Because we'd worked hard to get that thing there and and run it, and, you know, a big expense to carry it out there and run it anyway. And you wasn't going to win any money with it to mount anything unless you won the eliminator, which I think we could have done. But we didn't get to run it. Nothing gets to her more than being told he can't race, especially when he knows he can win. Early in the year, Sox and Martin update their race car stable with some big changes. Ronnie gets a new ride, a purpose-built 71 Heavy Cuda. And they built Ronnie a new 71 car, which was absolutely the best car in the country in 71. That car was unbelievable. Late that November, Herb's 70 Duster, the tow truck, and trailer are all destroyed by a fire following a towing accident. So to get him back out on the starting line as soon as possible, Buddy gives him one of Ronnie's well-used hand-me-downs. But it requires a lot of work to keep running and competitive. Buddy has a plan. Buddy came to me, asked me, he said, we got to get somebody to work with you and travel with you full time. And he asked me if there's anybody that I knew that I'd really like to have to work with. And I told him, yeah, Gail Mortimer. And he said, that works for Landy? And I said, yeah. I said, Gail and I are good friends. I said, I've worked with him, you know, when I drove that car for Landy, and I'd really like to have him if you could get him. Snagging Gail away from Landy for Sox and Martin would be a huge win for Herb and sweet revenge for Pomona, 1969. Well, the next morning, I come downstairs. Buddy and Gail are eating breakfast in the restaurant. And so that tickled me to death. And so about two weeks later, Gail was in North Carolina. So I kind of got Landy back for taking me out of that car. I stole his best helper. <laughs> Having Gail on board really rounds out the Sox and Martin garage. We, we were just very blessed in the, in the people in our, you know, a whole Sox and Martin team. That's, it was, yeah, running my name were on the door of the car, but it was a whole team that made Sox and Martin. The first match race Gail went to with me, we ran Great Battles, New Jersey. And Gail had worked for Landy for several years. And they tend to break a lot of parts and pieces that we didn't. So I went and made the first run, and I get back to the truck, and Gail's got the spare rear end sitting out, he's got the spare transmission sitting out, the floor jack, the jack stands, the spare clutch, all this stuff is laid out in the truck. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm getting all this stuff ready in case we need it. I said, put all that stuff back in the truck where it belongs. We're going to change the water in the car, run the next round. So he puts everything back up, and we win the match race, and we're driving out of Great Metis. Gail was driving the truck, and he's riding along looking at his shirt and looking at his pants and just kind of weird. I said, what are you doing? He said, I never left a drag strip this clean before in my life. <laughs> so Gail and I got along great. Even though women aren't allowed on the road, they're a critical part of the team. It falls on wives to keep the home fires burning. Marie is no exception, and the relationship that Herb and Marie share reflects it. We had a great relationship. We, she really loved what I did, and uh, I was gone so much. It was just incredible what she did. And one time I left for five weeks and come home for two days and left again for three weeks. So, but that's, you know, we were racing four, three or four days a week, a lot of times four days a week. And uh, she hung right in there with the best of it. And in August 1971, Marie gets to show just how supportive she is yet again. Marie was about nine months pregnant with David. 
The doctor told us that, no, it's going to be about two more weeks. Everything's fine. So I left and went to Epic, New Hampshire. We left Friday night, drove all day Saturday, got in there Saturday afternoon. I called the house. I didn't get an answer. I said, oh, Lord, here we go again. So I called the hospital, and everybody in Burlington knew us. And the lady answered the phone. She says, oh, yeah, Herb said, uh, they just delivered your little boy down here. So I told him, I said, well, tell her I'll see her Tuesday morning. So we ran that weekend. I won that AHR Grand American event and got back home sometime in the middle of the night, Monday night, Tuesday morning. In addition to its on-track exploits, Sox and Martin stays busy building race cars for other drivers. And due to Herb's exceptional mechanical and driving skills, this often includes him. Sometimes working with customers yields surprises, even at major events like the 1971 Super Nationals in Ontario, California. The end of 71, Ronnie had gone to the World Finals in Ontario. I didn't go out with the CUDA. They decided to put a Dodge together for the Sox and Martin team. Of course, I was going to drive it. So we started building a Challenger. With the pro stocks, and especially the cars that we were doing for customers, as we all are aware, usually if you sell something to someone and it doesn't go as quick, or it doesn't go as fast or whatever, immediately it's the car. Well, that's not always the case. And that's why we wanted Ronnie or Herb to take the car, take it to the track, make runs in it, show the customer what the car will do, and then what they do with it is up to them. So the phone rings at the shop at 3.30 on Friday afternoon, and it's Buddy. He said, Herb, I need you out here. A customer had bought a car, brand new Cuda. They picked it up about a month ago, and they had that car screwed up so bad it wouldn't even get out on the drag strip. So he said, I need you out here to drive this car tomorrow. So I go to the airport, get on a plane. I get there at 3 o'clock in the morning. No matter when I called him, where I called him, where I sent him, whatever, he went, he did, and he, he did it proudly and, you know, represented us proudly. And Gail had gone out there to California to that race with him, so I had Gail there with me, which was great. So we pulled this car apart. The transmission was all screwed up in it. The clutch was messed up. So we finally got it together about 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon. I got in line to make a run, and I qualified the car, no problem. We started running the car Sunday and came down to Butch Leal and Ronnie, Reed Wisnett, myself. No doubt people noticed that three of those cars are Sox and Martin products. So it came down to me and Ronnie in the finals, and we were the first two teammates to ever run each other in a pro eliminator in HRA. There's a picture somewhere of Ronnie and I running, and Ronnie's front wheel is sitting on the finish line, and my front wheel is touching the finish line. We looked at each other. We didn't know who won. And when we got back, you know, Ronnie had beat me. So when I got back to the shop, I told Bird Schaffner, he did the motor for the, the black car that I was driving. I said, yeah. I said, Jay King beat me at, at Pomona. And Bird said, what do you mean? I said, well, he, Ronnie drove around me in high gear. I had him covered. And Bird said, that won't happen again. And it didn't. Since the birth of Pro Stock in 1970, Sox and Martin's operation has dominated the field. But Chrysler Pro Stocker's ruling the day is fixing to change. We won 75% of all the NHRA Nationals in uh, 70 and 71. And of course, at the end of 71, we got word that NHRA was going to put a weight on us and not on the other cars for 72. Never one to shrink from a challenge, Buddy addresses the issue head on. Jack Hart was the executive director of NHRA at the time, and uh, I had a meeting with him, and I was trying to, you know, tell him that it was going, going to mess things up. It wasn't going to, to be a good deal. And uh, he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, if we can get Fords and Chevrolets racing against each other, I could care less what Chrysler does. And that was not a good feeling. The extra weight decision sticks, but Buddy's seen how fans respond to heads up racing, and with a new rule, he decides to shift the team in a new direction. Right at the end of 71, Gil and I were building a Challenger, and Buddy came out and said, uh, take the Challenger over to the customer car part and let them finish it over there. Y'all are going to build A body cars. Herb and Gail find themselves at the perfect place and time in drag racing history to put their innovative ideas into action. 
Backed by parts from Chrysler and an open checkbook from a very determined Sox and Martin team, combined with their own years of experience, they set out to build a car that will meet the new NHRA rules and dominate heads-up drag racing. So they delivered us two body and whites. Nothing but the shell. There's no parts, pieces, nothing. All you get is the skin and the floor pan. That's it. We had a skin of a car as a body. Although Chrysler's race bodies really aren't white, it's a term that's used to describe a shell vehicle before its components such as the motor, trim, glass, seats, and electronics are added. So we built a, a six-inch I-beam fixture and mounted the body on it. We welded the rocker panels on legs and mounted them up where we could work under it. Then we mounted the floor to the fixture. Then we cut 143 spot wheels we cut loose in the car and took the entire floor out of the car in one piece because you had to run the stock floor in the cars back then. We spaced it up two inches and welded everything back in. Well, what that essentially did was drop the body down two inches closer to the ground because the floor pan stayed the same distance from the ground. As it turns out, it's a stroke of genius to attach the floor two inches up in the body. Just simply by lowering it down, getting it closer to the ground to get it out of the wind. Nobody ever figured that out, thank goodness, but we did it. <laughs> and to gain a competitive edge, modifications to race cars are becoming more and more common. So to keep the stock in stock cars and make sure everybody's on the level playing field, NHRA makes some changes. NHRA had said they were going to stop us from messing with these cars. So we didn't want to do anything wrong. We wanted to meet the rules. And they said they were going to measure from the center of the wheel to the tip of the front bumper, center of wheel to center of wheel, center of wheel to the tip of the back bumper. So we lengthened the front fenders two inches, moved the front wheels forward two inches, cut the car in half and shortened it two inches in the back. We moved the back wheels up two inches so it met every dimension. Buddy carried the car through tech at Columbus. I didn't even go over there, I was scared to. And he came back and said, they said that car measured perfect. So I was very appreciative of that. So what we actually done was move the body and everything back over the wheelbase is what it amounted to, which made the car work that much better. Herb and Gail figure out that every inch counts and they make the most of what they're allowed to do. Herb gets it, that in order to propel the most power from the motor to the back tires, he has to minimize the loss of energy from front to back. Everyone thought the car should twist as they leave the start line. You look at pictures back then, everybody's car had the left front wheel six inches higher than the right front wheel. You look at pictures of this car, both wheels are identically the same height. Every piece of this car, I welded together myself. We built the cage in the car, and we actually attached the cage to the body of the car. It's attached in little places. We put a strip about a eighth inch thick, two inch long steel between the roll bar and the body and welded it to the body. So we made the thing like a bridge to tie the car together and make it stiffer. We brought the bars in and tied them to the suspension on the cars. We made this car as stiff as we could possibly make it. This car never twisted, never did anything stupid. And when I let go of the clutch on this car, it left. While modifying the demon body handles the big picture, Herb and Gale have a lot more in their minds. It's not just about building the fastest car on the track, it's also about creating efficient work processes so the car is easy to work on week after week. We took this car and moved the frame rails out an inch on each side and put an E-body K-member so we'd have more header clearance where you look down there you can see the headers. That gave us two inches more. Two inches is a mile when you're working inside an engine compartment. You see the radiator is much smaller in this car. This is all sealed off because you didn't want air coming through there. It worked like a big parachute. So we sealed all that off and brought the air in under the front bumper up to the radiator. We did away with the master cylinder on this side. Well, in order to take the valve cover off, you had to take the master cylinder off the car. Yeah. You had rubber hoses on it, it was the only way to do it. So we just took it and turned it around backwards. We extended where the brake pedal pivots, we extended the brake pedal up through the clamshell piece, what I called it, that holds it, mounted the master cylinder up here. So when you push the brake pedal down, it was pushing back. And it pushed the push rod into the master cylinder pushing it the opposite way from what it did up here. The master cylinder is underneath the dash. Urban Gale study how to maximize every single part of the car. And just because no one's done it before, that doesn't stop these so guys. NHRA said that we could put rack and pinions on the cars in 72. Well, nobody ever put a rack and pinion on, one of, on the Chrysler cars. The, the Pentos and them, they had rack and pinions, we didn't. So we had to take everything loose off the frame on both sides and turn it around. 
because the car was designed to steer behind the K-member, now we're steering in front of the K-member. Then we put the rack and pinion in the cross member, and we had to cut and lengthen arms, bend arms. We worked on this thing for about three weeks. The ideal situation was to have it so as the car went up and down, the front wheels did not move. They stayed perfectly straight. Well, we got it to that point, and Christ was afraid we were going to kill ourselves. So they sent down a bunch of engineers, and they bolted all this stuff to the spindles and the steering and turned the wheels and jacked the car up and down and measured here everywhere packed their stuff up and went home. They said, y'all don't need us, you've got this figured out. With a solid thumbs up from Chrysler's engineering team, Herb is even more confident that there's no holding them back now. The car has fiberglass front end on it, fiberglass trunk lid, and these windshields in this car were special made windshields. They were quite a bit lighter than a standard windshield. Everything on this car, every nut, bolt, part, and piece on this car was either acid dip, ground on, or drilled. The original bolts that helped the stock fenders and stuff on it, the fenders were rifle drilled from the bottom. The bolts in the suspension were rifle drilled from the bottom. The brake drums are all uh, drilled full of holes. The brake shoes were drilled with holes in them. The backing plates were acid dipped and drilled. Upper control arms, lower control arms, cross member, all that was acid dipped to get weight off of it. We acid dipped the bell housing to get weight off of it. We took about four or five pounds off the bell housing. We put a ladder bar suspension on it. We used a 1 inch 156 wall piece of tubing to build the ladder bars out of. I put them in the lathe, left three inches on each end that we could thread and put the hind joints in, and then I cut 100 thousandths off the center part of the tube. We took about eight pounds off the ladder bars. The body was dipped so thin on this car that we actually took this car to Holman and Moody in Charlotte where they built NASCAR, and they were spraying a foam in the floors of those cars for the heat for the drivers. Well, we got Gerd to spray the foam inside the quarter panels, the doors, and the roof because if some 200-pound guy came up and plopped herself against the quarter panels, he would have caved our quarter panel in. They were that thin. The only thing we wanted the quarter panels for was to hold paint. Anything we could do to lighten the car, we did it. I don't care what it was or how much time it took. Shaving the Demon body weight down gives engine builder Bird Schaffner the space he needs to keep his promise. Now we can use those pounds to pack in more power. We ran two distributors. We ran two magnetos with 16 spark plugs. We had two plugs to each cylinder. This magneto is driven off the cam and the, and the oil pump drive gear. And then there's a belt in here that drives this one. This was a 1050 carburetor, which is the biggest carburetor available at that time. Instead of being progressive, these carburetors were set up so when you gave it gas, all eight barrels opened at the same time. We were constantly looking for, you know, a few thousands, a few hundreds, a few thousands of seconds, whatever we could get. Racing against an almost impossible deadline, Herb and Gale put in monumental hours to get the build done. There was no eight-hour day. We were there 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. We were usually there until 10, 11 at night. That wasn't unusual. And that was seven days a week. What Herb, Gale, and the Sox and Martin team do with the Demon in five short months is staggering. And it pays off. We took the 72 car to Columbus, made the first run in it. Never made a run down the track before we got there that day. And the first run I made in the car, I ran landing, and I beat him to the finish line. And Gale had tears in his eyes when I got back to the truck. He was so excited. He was just crying. He was just so happy that car had come out as good as it did. The 72 Demon is not the only exciting thing going on at Sox and Martin. Buddy and Bill Jenkins are hard at work putting together a pro stock heads up event series that combines the best of all worlds. They call it the United States Racing Team. We thought that, you know, if we could get four each of the Ford, Chevrolet, Chrysler, and Dodge, that uh, it would. Uh, definitely make a good show. It was the best 16 cars in the country. We ran on Wednesday nights at all the big tracks. We all came in on Tuesday and set our cars up in a shopping mall and talked to people and, you know, just mingle with the crowd and show people the cars and explain the cars to them. And a lot of people never seen anything like these cars. And they would get interested and show up at the track. It wasn't unusual to put 6,000 people in a drag strip on a Wednesday night back in 1972 with that United States racing team group. Much like the car clinic road shows, which were a huge success with the fans. And this time, it's all the manufacturers working together. The way it worked, we'd go into the track and we'd all just draw numbers and pair up and all 16 cars would make a run, you know, side by side, eight, eight pairs. Well, the fastest Ford, the fastest Chevy, the fastest Dodge and the fastest Plymouth, those four cars would come back and run each other. The other 12 cars would continue an elimination 
series also. And it was absolutely the best pro stock show that you could go to. It was better than any major event. It was better than anything. It was something that uh, I think everybody that participated in it was very surprised and very pleased and very thrilled at how it turned out. Being on the U.S. team certainly adds to the workload, but for Herb, it's worth every extra minute. Herb's also making the most of his Rolodex to improve his new race car. Gail and I run the match race at Quaker City, Ohio, and Bill Abraham invited us up to the Firestone Country Club to eat lunch. Well, we didn't have no business at the Firestone Country Club. It was a free meal, so we went. So we're at the Firestone Country Club eating lunch with Bill Abraham and Bert Thomas. And I asked Bill, I said, well, when are we going to get some new tires? I said, these 12, 231 and quarters we're running, we're just overpowering them. We need some better tires. And they looked at each other and laughed. And I said, let me rephrase this question. Where are these new tires? And Bill said, they're over in the warehouse. You want to try them? I said, you're darn right I do. So we finished eating and go over to the warehouse, and he rolls out the first two 1432 tires that we'd ever seen. They didn't even say fire to them. They were blank sidewalls. They were just test tires they put together. So we went and mounted them up. So we went over to Quaker City that night, and I told Gail, I said, it's time to put them tires on. So we jacked the car up and put them on. We picked up over a tenth of a second that night with those tires. So that was on a Wednesday night. We ran Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I get back to the shop, the phone rings Tuesday morning. It's Bill Abraham. He said, Herb, did you run everybody in the country this weekend? I said, I sure did. And he said, you beat everybody. I said, everybody I pulled up beside. He said, my phone is ringing off the wall. Everybody's wanting to know when they can get them tires. He said, it's gonna be two weeks before we get these tires made. I said, well, Bill, send me another set. Mine be wore out by then. The new tires are about to make Herb famous and in an unexpected way at the Summer Nationals in July. We were at English Town in 1972, NHRA major event. We were down to four cars, and when I heated the tires and did the burnout, the wheelie bar broke. So Buddy and Gail made the decision just to pull the pin out of the other one and let me run it without the wheelie bars. Well, when I did the burnout behind the starting line, the car went straight up in the air and the car went out across the starting line. I pulled second gear with it up in the air and brought it down. Well, you weren't allowed to cross the starting line, so Bob Daniels wanted to throw me out. And Buster Couch said, no, Buster ran the starting line. So he pointed me to go to the starting line. Well, I went up there and I turned it all it would turn, hoping it would just spin the tires a little bit instead of doing that wheel stand again. So when I left the starting line, it did it again. I think that's one reason there were a lot of pictures of that because the photographers had figured out what it was gonna do. And it went straight up in the air and I drove through it and set the car down, never even scratched the oil pan. And Jenkins laughed because he said he won the race and I got all the ink. Herb sure can't raise flying up in the air, and lucky for him, his Rolodex has also snagged him a side job that's going to help. In Michigan, he's running tests on new car parts and configurations for the engineers at Chrysler. So we went to Milan to test the next Tuesday, or the Tuesday after that Sunday. And Mr. Hoover, being the most intelligent person I ever met, he said, what's happening with the car? It doesn't go up as quick as you think it does. It acts like a pogo stick. It kind of lunges and then goes up. He said, we've got to take that lunge and rise out of it. So we pulled the car over to the truck and I took the torsion bars out of the front suspension and laid them on the ground. Just took them out of the car. Couldn't make a run like that, but I drove it up to the starting line like that. And I made some burnouts with it. Well, at the test, we had 50 foot clocks. So I got out of the car because the car didn't do anything but leave. The front end of the car never moved. And as far as raising up, so the car would leave just like somebody kicked it. And I backed up and got out of the car and I said, wow, that was awful. I said, the car didn't feel like it left. Well, Al Adams started laughing. He said, Herb, that's the quickest that car has ever been in 50 feet since you've been up here. So we went home, put the torsion bars in the lathe and I spent nine hours cutting the torsion bars down. They weren't as big around as your little finger when I got through with them. And we put them back in the car and went out and ran the car and the car immediately picked up I don't know, six, eight hundred, something like that, maybe a tenth. It picked up a bunch because the car was burning horsepower, picking the wheels up off the ground instead of going forward. So there again, we had an advantage over everybody for a while.
the last match race I ran with the 72 car, but he had it sold to Jeffrey Jarris, and they actually picked it up at the race at Long Island. I ran a 901 with the car that day against Jenkins. I wanted to go 899 so bad in that car because I wanted to be the first person to do that, but uh, that was absolutely the best driving, best working car I ever sat down in in my life. Herb's put in his best year at the United States Racing Team and AHRA Pro Stock events, but the 1972 NHRA extra weight rule for Chrysler Hemi cars hits the team hard at the tracks. Chrysler cars, I think, won either one or two national meets in 1972. And it was just obvious that we couldn't carry the weight. And NHRA's other rule changes proved to be the nail in the coffin by the end of the year. They went to the small block, short wheelbase, and, uh, you know, even less weight. And between the two of them, Chrysler wanted to pull out of pro stock and pretty much did. Well, in 73, they changed the rules completely. Our 72 car, which was a very dominant car, was basically just legislated out of the program. The updated NHRA rules bring in a whole new era of racing. They went to a tube chassis car. So Don Hardy set up and built a, he built all the tube chassis for the Chryslers. He built them for the Pentos, the Vegas. He fixed them and hung the bodies on them or, you know, that was the first real tube chassis car. And there's another big change with the 73 car. They had put the Lenco in for 73. Everybody kind of caught up but they couldn't drive the four-speed. The crowd loved the four-speed cars, not because we had better engines and cars, but they knew they were real transmissions that we had to push the clutch down and shift the transmission. The faster the cars got, the less people there were that could actually drive the four-speed cars that quick. Well, this Lenco just turned them into drivers, and it really hurt the match racing thing to some extent. And the Lenco doesn't make the top four-speed racers very happy either. Of course, Ronnie and myself didn't, either one of us didn't like that. Nicholson didn't like it, Jenkins didn't like it, because it kind of, it took some of it out of it to us, but you know, we still love what we did, so we did it. Herb, always the loyal workhorse, puts his head down and runs the best he can. But what does he think of the car? The car was good, but you know, we had no idea. It was a brand new car. We loaded it up, put it in the truck, and took off. And it wound up, me and Stricker on the final run, and if I remember right, I red-lighted to him on the final run of that race, but. Uh, Back in Burlington, Buddy suddenly gets word that Chrysler's cutting the team back to just one red, white, and blue car. So to keep Herb racing in a 73 car, Buddy's on the lookout for a new sponsor. Buddy wanted to keep the car running because we actually made a profit with the car where most people couldn't, but we could stay booked enough and, and want enough that the car paid its way and you know paid for everybody and took care of itself. Gentleman from New York, Brooklyn Heavy, they called him. He came in and wanted his name on the car. He had three or four pro stock cars, but they couldn't win anything. They, so he came in and, and put some sponsorship behind the car, but he still maintained the car all through 73. We match raced a lot. We were running a match race up at Piedmont, and uh, Lee Edwards showed up with a Vega with about a 500 inch motor in it, and he just killed us that night. And so we decided that wasn't going to happen again. Never one to just lay down when he gets beat by something new. This time around, Herb's about to achieve a huge breakthrough in racing history. So Bird Schaffner put a 500-inch Hemi together, which we put in the uh, 73 car, went to ATCO. They had a run what you brung race at ATCO. That was the only rule, was run what you brung. And I brung a plenty. It was very cold, damp. The track was slick. Everybody was going 890s. That was as quick as anybody was going that day. And I made a burnout behind the starting line and it, there was no hope. I mean, it just blew the tires completely off the car. So I pulled up and staged the car and I'm sitting there at about 2,500 RPMs. I wouldn't bring the engine up. And Sonny was with me and everybody told me he was standing behind the starting line just screaming for me to bring the engine up, bring the engine up. And when the light come on, I just kind of drove the car away from the starting line, just swapped feet. And, stepped into it and it never blew the tires off of it. And the first pass, I went 8.56. Uh, I ran John Healy and he came over to me. He said, Herb, how big is that motor? I said, it's big enough. He said, I just made the quickest run I ever made in my life and you beat me a train length. When I got to the truck, I couldn't even get to my truck. The, the people were, it was just a mob scene at the truck. Everybody waiting on me to come back. After chasing 890s in the 72 Demon, it sure feels good to run 850s in the 73 car. So we ran 850s all day that day. That was the quickest anybody had ever gone. There was all kind of 
ads put out and they made a big deal out of it. And we should have changed the gear and done some other stuff, but this was a whole learning experience for us. So it was fun. I just drove it away from the start line like it was a street car or something. And oh boy, when I stepped into it, it was gone. Herb still got it. So it's no surprise that he's part of Chrysler's new plans for 1974. Well, Chrysler had been out in NHRA all of 73, and in 74, they decided they wanted a presence there. So they got four of us to put together some super stock cars, a 68 car, a 65 car, and two street Hemi cars. So they got me to put together, they wanted me to put together a street Hemi Barracuda convertible. So Mr. Maxwell called us and, you know, we got everything worked out, and he was sending us all the pieces to do it with, and he found a... 38371 Cuda convertible in Detroit in the paper for sale. So Sonny flew up and bought the car and drove it back to Burlington. And we immediately went through the car and put a cage in it and put a street Hemi in it. it made a really nice looking car, it really was. But. Getting ready for the year opener at Pomona, the team takes the car to California for testing. And we ran the car, went to Irwindale, made some runs in the car, just testing the car to make sure everything was okay. And it was, the car was very fast for the class. And we only ran the car three or four times. We ran Pomona and we ran Gainesville. And I think we ran Columbus and uh, I best I remember that's the only places that we ran it. Herb showing well with the Cuda wherever he runs it, but something big is brewing back home at the Sox and Martin shop where Buddy and the team have been hard at it for almost eight years. And what all that came down to was, is we were gone almost 300 days out of the year. And uh, so after a while, between that and the fact that my wife kept letting me know that we had two children that I didn't see much or wasn't seeing growing up. And uh, it, it, I guess I just got burned out and felt that it was best that I just back away, get away from it. Racing was very good to us. And the big thing that I missed the most was the people. When Buddy Martin steps away from racing, it's the end of a legendary era. Sox and Martin won better than 70% of the events they entered and set the industry standard for professionalism and appearance, and Herb's never taken his position on the team for granted. Well, people would ask me about, you know, driving the Sox and Martin cars and, and uh, driving with, working with Ronnie and, and with Buddy and Jake and Dave and everybody over there. And uh, I would tell them all the time, I had the same answer for them. I said, I have the second best job in the country Ronnie's got the best one and I don't care. And I didn't care, that's just the way I looked at it. And I was very proud to be a part of that team. He gives me a lot of credit many times for him being able to do or have this or have that or whatever. But anything that Herb has, he earned. In July 1974, Sox and Martin, a name forever associated with drivers who captured the attention and imagination of an entire country's race fans, closes its doors. Ronnie and Buddy go their separate ways, and Herb is looking for his next ride. It's a man.